morning. This is working. Perfect. How are you? Come on. Yay. Okay. Perfect. So I want to start with just like, can you please raise your hands? I know it's early in the morning, but raise your hands, make two fists, and put them like this. Right? This is basically the shape and size of your brain. It weighs about a standard milk package. And whatever you create through your entire life as you grow up, whatever creative spark that you have, it's going to come from this amazing brain, right? So this brain is carried around by a monkey body. And a monkey, sure, we are monkeys that can create subway systems. Hello? Sorry. Wow. Subway systems, expensive phones, and rockets that reland on re-entry, but nevertheless, they are monkeys, right? So, um, Thomas Edison, who is, is a monkey, said, the chief function of the body is to carry the brain around, and as we do so, we tend to self-organize into groups. Groups that work with the same things, fight for the same causes, and um, sometimes are blinded by our similarities. All right, and as we are among these groups and are blinded by our similarities, we tend to organize these similarities into belief systems. Sometimes we brand them as brands, sometimes we brand them as religions, but whatever they are, they tend to make us work better together. So, what I want to talk about today is really that if religions contain a lot of lenses for, of life, our companies contain a lot of lenses of innovation. And just like in December, in many parts of the world, we start to prepare and count the days to Christmas Day, we celebrate growing up, or as in Japan, we make wishes and hang them up and wish that they become true. So, at companies, we count the hours in our days, we stand up, and we put up wishes on walls and hope that they become true. So the thesis is really that whatever we do, we subscribe to a set of beliefs and we perform a set of ceremonies, and especially on a day like today, where we gather like many other conferences do, and we watch a monkey on stage try to create and share new beliefs. I want to talk about some mistakes that I've done listening to these beliefs in our industry thus lenses of innovation. So, I've tried to divide my ignorance into four different parts. One being my discipline, the other being my process, preferred process, third one being my values, and fourth being how I value truth, and what I think is true, and how I think something is true or not. So, I started out early on at Spotify, and at that time I was a UI designer, um, working with a process that I like to call design first. I think whatever happens at the company, I should be the one involved first. Design first. Then I valued simplicity, and truth was subjective, as in its taste. It's really difficult to get to an objective truth. So I believe this, for example, the polish on the back side of the cardboard is as important on the front side. I still believe this. I hope many of you agree in a room like this. And now, if other monkeys came that believed in numbers, I'd probably say something like this. Not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. As in, it's really difficult to put a number on true things, right? It's difficult to get to the truth, especially through some numbers. I still believe this. I also believed minimalism is good as in always. You can put an equal sign between minimalism and good. I do not believe this anymore, but I found this quote from Designers Guild. I'm not sure how many are a member of this Facebook group. It's a really big Facebook group, mostly active in Silicon Valley, around, I think, plus 10,000 members. Here's what someone said in this group the other day. We have to understand that when people make wrong design decisions, it's because they are design illiterates. That's not a bad thing. Everybody must not must not be a designer. As a designer, your job is to educate them patiently and not just complain about how bad their things are. We tell them about personas and etc., but we must, but we most of the time forget to tell them how design directly improves their competitive advantages and profit. We think they'll understand. We forget that they're not designers. We expect them to know. A way to get to this thing right is to pretend to be on their side. Relate everything you say to profit making, 
The good thing is that there's a direct connection. You have to make them see it. I think this is a good one. You have to pretend to be on the side. I think this was my, my mindset as a young designer, as in design is clearly the most important thing, but I can pretend to be on your side. That's fine, I can, I can pretend. So I think Spotify is an interesting case. Here are the numbers two years ago for all the paying subscribers for the different music services. Spotify being bigger than all the other competitors combined. Today, two years later, this is 30 million. Now they are at 70 million paying subscribers. Here are all the competitors that can't be on the list because they're too small. Here are all the competitors that can't be on the list because they have gone bankrupt. Beat Microsoft, yeah. Um, and I think this is really interesting, right? They went up against Apple, Microsoft, Google, the companies that build computers, the phones, and the infrastructure of the internet that we use. They are richer than the richest oil companies. They're not famous for playing by the rules at all times. They come from a country that is not famous for playing by the rules at all times. And then comes Spotify <laughs> from Europe, Sweden, a land of farms, Bill of the Bookshelf, Baby Bjorn, Meatballs, famous for standing in line awkwardly. <laughs> and from this country comes a bunch of nerds and they create this. Now, I think it's interesting to, in this case, ask the question, how did Spotify succeed? And as one of the very first designers and someone who was responsible for the UI design of all the apps in the beginning, I want to really believe that it was because of the design. I'm not so sure, right? So here's an old photo. Um, this is me with long hair. This is this guy, Sean Parker, famous for things like creating Napster, almost appearing in a movie, and investing early in Facebook. Um, and I remember us here having a dis discussion and me saying things like, well, if we need an arrow to point to the playlist, something else is wrong. The product isn't simple enough, we shouldn't need an arrow. And I still sort of agree with this, but I wonder now how really important that discussion was and how important the design was at all. So I wanted to believe that Spotify's success was at least in part due to its design, but I'm not so sure. So what else could be important? Let's just look at this as not designers and try to be objective about it. So some other success factors probably behind Spotify success is the fact that Spotify is the only music streaming service that has a free tier. No other product to this day has a free tier. They all have free trials, not um, an infinite free tier. They were also really lucky because Scandinavia was ahead in the broad broadband adoption, which meant that they could try a streaming product in a set of countries where it maybe wouldn't even work in other countries, right? So they were lucky to that extent. They also used lessons from the pirate industry. You might not know this, you, you probably, how many have used this website? Yeah, okay. So you might know that if you, you're using a website like this, you also need something like this. Now, this very micro, oh, sorry, micro turn, this very turn client is actually at the core of the first version of Spotify. Spotify actually bought that up sold it again, kept the technology, and if you listen to a song, you would start streaming that song to your neighbor. As in, they really sold an infrastructure problem as an early startup without a lot of money. The more customers they had, the easier it was for them to stream music or us to new customers. Clever. You might be thinking, but all of this is design in a way, right? Yes, it is design, but still, my discipline was visual design, and I was biased, and it bit me. Here's another example. How, member, how many know of this feature in Spotify? Discover Weekly, yes. I hope you love it, I love it. Um, I think it's, it's really good, it gives me a lot of good music, and also as a designer, I can appreciate certain aspects of it, like, for example, this. Lost version. As in, people's tendency to prefer avoiding losses to acquiring equivalent gains, it's, e it's better to not lose $5 than to find $5. As in, if I ask you to work to get $5, you're more likely to, if I first give you $5, work to keep those five. As in, that's really what Spotify does. It gives you music, and then you don't want to lose it, so maybe on Sunday night you'd be like, shit, I have to save all this music, or I have to listen to it. 
versus going into a new view and finding some new stuff. What you also do is you establish a habit because every single Monday it's your Discover Weekly Day, so it's a clever recurring mechanism. And here's the kicker. I really wish I come up with Discover Weekly. I didn't. And that's because I think of this reason partly. If all you have a hammer, have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. As in, if you're feeling bad, a physician believes there's an issue with your body, a psychiatrist with your head, personal trainer with your exercise, and a life coach with your motivation. As in, we've already decided, depending on our expertises, how we're going to solve the problem. And that's what I did. So I was blinded by my expertise, and I, had, I got this problem several times. Please recommend music to our users. I'm like, don't give me the solution, give me the problem. I'm a designer, I can, I can work with the problem. But even though I got this so many times, every single time I sat down and I said, let me just draw how that view is gonna look like. Let me sit down and draw that concept. So I was blinded over and over again by my expertise. So after a while, I've started asking myself, did Spotify actually succeed because of my design or despite my design? This is really an issue of correlation and causation. I found a better quote to explain this. Here's Paul. Paul, a startup founder in New York, says he and his employees are less stressed since they started microdosing. That's taking LSD. Uh, but he couldn't be sh absolutely sure about the cost and effect. He thinks it might have also been the product management app Asana, which they started using at the same time to keep organized. Thank you, Paul, for being so humble. I wish, I wish we would all evaluate our processes like this. Now, later, I started working at GitHub. At GitHub, I went from being solely a designer to working as a designer and developer. And I went from thinking that design should come first to just being pragmatic and thinking, whatever the, whatever the situation is, we can just be flexible. So as a, as a short example of how that looked like was that we had a site that looked like this, get up for Mac, didn't look that good, here's some other pages. This turned into this site, somewhat better, clearer, bigger screenshots, new cleaned up header, a help site, and we shipped this from problem definition, from the first problem definition to being live, it took less than 48 hours. Not a single meeting, all on GitHub. Basically, this was the discussion, MDO saying, I don't care, Sure, use a blurred background, or at least saying, yes, blurred, we committed that, and we were done, and we were 240 people, but we avoided all bureaucracy because we valued shipping. Shipping was our core value at the time. And this kept on happening. We shipped a lot of sites that took no time, and this became sort of my belief system. I wanted to become more pragmatic, I valued shipping. Truth, though, was still subjective. subjective. It was not something that you could measure necessarily. Now, after that, I went back to Sweden. I started teaching more at Hyper Island. I ran a lot of A-B tests at companies, and I realized how ignorant I had been. I also started teaching data-driven product design, and when I did that, I naturally started replacing some of these, and instead of value shipping, I started valuing results. And I think as soon as you start focusing on results, you have to measure them, and therefore I became naturally more inclined to believe in an objective truth that you can measure. Now, at the time, I think maybe I thought that I grew up. I don't think I grew up. I just started making different kinds of mistakes. And I think the mistakes are predicted by our lenses that we adopt. So for example, this I think is a common set of lenses to have in this day and age. You might be a designer, you're working in an agile process, you value results and truth is objective. Now, if you do this and you work on a product like a streaming service, video or music, I think it's a question of time before you add the most horrible <laughs> feature, which is autoplay. Sorry for the Swedish labels. Autoplay is a feature designed to change metrics, right? And I think if you have this belief system, it's a question of time before you implement it. I don't think many sat down and thought, this is a great experience. 
autoplay bites me like at least once a week. But if you have that way of working, you're going to design this feature. So right now I'm at Minecraft. I'm working as the experience design director. It's a game that has sold more than any other game except Tetris. We'll get there. And it feels like I'm back to where I started because at Minecraft, they did this without measuring basically anything. Right? The truth was completely subjective. All they did was listen to the community constantly. That was their way of getting feedback. And then they made gut feeling decisions and they created this product, a bunch of people without this modern way of working. So I have started asking myself now, sort of being back in my young naive mindset, what is the right composition of, of lenses? Surely some lenses have to be better than others, right? I think that should be the case. Now, when we talk about this, I think this is at the core. Innovation is about trying to invent the future. We're always trying to make improvements, right? And so we're trying to predict how a better future looks like. That's what we do when we do a brainstorm. We have a lot of ideas, then we pinpoint the one we think are most valuable. So we're trying to predict how to get into a more or better future. The interesting thing is that there are actually some really good research on how to become better at predicting the future. And now we might be asking ourselves, what are some key indicators? Is it possibly higher IQ? Does that lead to making better predictions? Maybe more experience, more information, or maybe certain beliefs. Now, this is from a study that took over 20 years to complete. It's called the Good Judgment and Political Forecasting Study. It was done by Philip Tetlock, amongst others, at the University of Pennsylvania. And they created a prediction market, and they uh, crowdsourced their predictions, and they actually outperformed FBI, NSA, and CIA, despite having less information than all of these. And while um, performing better than them, they also starting finding correlation, correlations between acting in a certain way and making better predictions. So. They looked through their data, and not only did they find correlations, but they found a causal relationship between having better judgment and personality traits. And you might be wondering, how the hell did they do that? That's a really good question. What they did is they first found a correlation. They then taught that correlation to subsets within their group and then saw how they started changing in their judgment, as in they ran an A-B test within their study. So, it was not IQ, not more information, and not a certain belief system. That's what I think is interesting. Basically, if we start on the opposite side, now dogmatism led to bad judgment. They defined key indicators of dogmatism like this. You have strong opinions, you have simple answers to difficult questions, like if you can answer in a sentence why Donald Trump won the election, that's a very simple answer to a difficult question. You're confident you're in your ability to judge. You have one view of the world, and you, then you update the rules of proof to fit that worldview. As in, if you don't believe in climate change, and then there, there's new proof for that, you just change how you judge proof. And then you can keep on believing whatever you want to believe. You also look for facts to prove yourselves right. Now, I think that if, well, yeah, if you do that, you tend to get stuck. In, in a certain mindset and then not realize that you're doing something wrong. They call these people hedgehogs. As in, you have your spikes outwards, you're defensive. I think that if they did this study today, they'd have a different metaphor. Now, nuanced view basically leads to better judgment. That's the opposite of what we just went through. You have an open mindset and you're curious, some key indicators for that is basically the uh, polar opposite. You carefully weigh proofs for and against. You have complex answers to difficult questions. You're confident in the difficulty of judging a certain situation. You update their views uh, of the world uh, after being exposed to new evidence. And then you look for facts to prove themselves wrong. They call these foxes. 
if you want to visualize this over time, this is, I think, a fair description. Hedgehog, they have one view, things happen, nothing changes. Fox, on the other hand, has one view, things change, they get four new theories of why that happened. They will not, all of them can't be true at the same time, right? So you hold conflicting beliefs in your head simultaneously at the same time. Then you get more information, you misvalidate some, some lead to new theories, and suddenly the world is even more complex, but at least you're getting closer to the truth. The problem is, of course, like today and in many other contexts, like in a debate, it would be very boring if people always stood on stage and said, it depends. That's not very fun, right? So we have this incentive to create contexts where people have very strong opinions. Please ignore the fact that Steve Ballmer is the former CEO of Microsoft, E, my former boss. Minecraft is, is owned by Microsoft, as you might know. He said in 2007, there's no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share, no chance it's a $500 subsidized item. <sighs> Steve. So, um, let's just to capture your, if, see if we're aligned, let's quickly vote here. If you think this statement is wrong, please raise your hand and do a thumbs down. If you think it's okay, this statement, please raise your hand and do a thumbs middle. And if you think it's a good statement, please raise your hand and do a thumbs up. Please do this now with me. Thank you. Yeah, I don't want to vote myself. Okay, yeah, I see a lot of thumbs down. So let's, if you want to be kind to Steve, remember that actually the world was very different back then. This is from the same month, November 2007, Forbes, Nokia, one billion customers. Can anyone catch the cell phone king? Can anyone catch? Yeah, that's a good question. So here's the full quote from Steve Ballmer's interview. Um, it's sort of a funny question. Would I trade 96% of the market for 4% of the market? I want to have products that appeal to everybody. Now we'll get a chance to go through this again in phones and music players. He's referring to iPod, if you remember that thing. Uh, then the quote, they may make a lot of money, but if you actually take a look at the 1.3 billion phones that get sold, I prefer to have a softer in 60 or 70 or 80% of them than I would to have two or three, which is what Apple might get. Now, I think this is actually interesting. He's pinpointing Apple's strategy here. They may make a lot of money. That's actually what Apple tries try to do, right? They're not necessarily out for market share. So I think he ha he, he's got a point. If we look at the data uh, in the world, the, the few years after he said this quote, this is roughly what we saw and what we still see. iOS hovering about 20%, Android being then the biggest player. Let's ignore Microsoft here. It's, it's less at least than, than I would imagine, right? Just guessing. So he pinpointed that and he pinpointed this. Given that, what do you think? Was he really wrong or semi-wrong? I think I would give him maybe a middle thumb. Let's do this again. But if you actually take a look at the 1.3 billion phones that get sold, he's referring to this market, as in all phones in the entire world, not just smartphones. So if we count that, all of it, and we see how many are iPhones, we get this. 4.2 of all phones, this is 2011 and 10. And in Steve Ballmer's prediction, 4%, 2010, 4%, next year, around 5%. I think it was pretty much right. This is John F. Kennedy saying, for the great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth Persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. Too often we hold fast to the cliches of our forebears. We subject all facts to a prefabricated set of interpretations. We enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. As in, this is not the right question, right? It's not about the beliefs. It's about being overconfident in our set of lenses. Like when we judge Steve Ballmer pretty quickly. 
So therefore, not even strong opinions lucid held, but the ability to say, I don't know. The ability to say, I don't know, is one of the key drivers behind making good decisions. So I often thought, or for a long time, that this meant that your company should have a scientific process, as in you do a lot of A-B tests, and then you become nuanced. But recently started to believe that if your entire company acts in that way, you are still a homogenous group and you're blinded by your similarities. Now there's actually some data from the study on this. Obama has publicly actually complained about a certain situation that he thought was really tricky. What happens was that he got information from different intelligence um, or, uh, institutes or organs about bin Laden's location. Right? This was before the attack. They all said that they thought he was in a certain house with a probability of 70%. We usually think of probability as an average. So if we get a lot of probabilities, we should just add them up and divide it by the number, and then we should get the final number. Therefore, it should still be 70. No, that's not actually the case. And they proved this in the study, too. If a lot of people thought that something would happen with a certain probability and they had different information, it became more than 70. They call this... Uh, extremize an opinion, and this is the best metaphor that I've found. If you're all in a city and you're at different points standing and trying to figure out where the center of a city is, and you guess, I'm guessing here that the city is in this direction, the city core, the city center is in this direction, and this is my point of view, and I make certain guesses depending on that view or that lens. And then you have someone else do that same judgment, but with different information. And when you add these all up, they add up to more than 70%. This is, I think, why cross-functional teams are one of the core concepts behind creating a nuanced company. If you have a product owner, an agile coach, designers, developers, and data analysts, you have a common goal but conflicting beliefs, you have lenses and conflict in the same way if you have different designers that believe maybe that simplicity is important, fun is important, speed, quality, accessibility. You have a common goal but conflicting values. You have some that believe in objective data, some in subjective taste. You have common goal but conflicting beliefs. So I started to think that what we should strive for is diversity. As in, if we're one monkey, this is our decision making, but if we're monkeys in conflict, we can evolve our ideas together. That's it, that's all I have, thank you.